right, welcome friends and comrades here with a very special interview with Michael J. Thompson from uh, William Patterson University. And he is the author of The Domestication of Critical Theory, The Twilight of the Self, The Decline of the Individual in Late Capitalism, and several other very important interventions. Uh, Professor Thompson is a political theorist I really read you as a philosopher. I don't know if you call yourself a philosopher, but you, you, you are really working in a Marxist philosophical orientation. Um, and I, I, I don't know if these labels mean much to you, but can you start off by giving us a sense of how you uh, sort of look at your vocation as an intellectual? Could you could you give us a sense of that? And and a and then b give us a sense of your uh, commitment to the Marxist tradition, which having read your work is a very serious commitment. Uh, I guess with term, with respect to labels, um, I think philosophy captures it best. Philosophy and theory I see as um, coeval in terms of, um, in terms of their activity, especially in an age of like ours, which is so drained of praxis, where political practice has really um, kind of withered um, and largely been absorbed by liberalism. So in a lot of ways, I think a return to philosophy and rethinking the categories for critical thought is essential because of the intense nature of the rationalization that takes place under technological society, under the way technology has technology and capitalism um, relate, and the way that um, honestly that capitalism has become really a total phenomenon, mm. a total form of life, in which means that consciousness, reflection, thought um, is the ultimate victim, the final what you could say, I guess, the final domain that capital has been able to really capture is the psyche. Mm. And so I think this is one reason why um, a return, not just to Marx, I mean, Marx, Mar there's Marx and there's Marxism. Right. And that's when things get complicated. Uh -huh. But um, I think Marx lays out for us, um, because he's heir to one of the most important movements of intellectual movements of the modern world, which is German idealism, mm. that Marx um, lays out for us a kind of um, way of understanding judgment and human affairs, humanism as a mode of engaging with the world and trying to make it better. Mm. Um, that is unique, deeply powerful, and on par with what, say, Darwin did in the natural sciences or Freud did in the psychological sciences, which is to, to actually give us a foundation for a new form of reason, mm. a form of reason that's not detached from the world the way 18th century enlightenment rationality mm. was, uh, scientific method, pure epistemology, um, truth claims, something that made a return in the 20th century um, with, uh, you know, in philosophy of mind and theories of epistemology and science and theories of philosophies of science that Marx holds to this really core idea that goes back to the Greeks, that reason has substance, mm. that value and judgment um, are really intertwined with what we understand as reason. So that the world could be made rational mm. um, and therefore to be made truly free and overcome the kind of dualisms and separations that um, modern reason uh, impose on us. So I think that's a reason to return to Marx. And the strand of Marxism that I've always found compelling and rich is that is Western Marxism, Western mm -hmm. Marxism and critical theory mm -hmm. um, and its different strands and Lukash. Uh, is at the at the center of that Lukash and people like Karl Korsch and Antonio mm. Gramsci, but Lukash is one of the most important figures because of the return to consciousness, the idea that self reflection is important, the idea that reason is important, the mm. idea that ethics is important, mm. the idea that you know individuals 
are not simply going to mechanistically become political, politically engaged, mm. and revolt. Mm. That instead reflection is necessary. Mm. And so Lukash, as early as 1923, by the way, Lukash and Karl Korsch published their books within mm. two, three months of one another. Marxism and Philosophy by Korsch, where he talks about return to the subjective factor. Mm. And Lukash, of course, publishes 100 years ago, um, History and Class Consciousness, which makes an inc incredibly rich and philosophically sophisticated plea for a return to thinking and thought and its relation to Marxism and materialism. So as I see it, this is a rich philosophical heritage that was largely and has continued to be largely pilloried by postmodernism, post-structuralism, um, irrationalist strands of leftist theory and, mm. uh, and uh, pseudo-Marxism. Mm. And I think there's been a slow, gradual return to attending to Lukács's thoughts yes. in the past decade, say. Yeah. So Marxism for you is a comprehensive philosophical contribution in line with the Enlightenment. And it's a, sort of a doctrine of liberation. It has this subjective emphasis coming out of Western Marxism. Uh, now, that is a picture slightly different than, say, the Marxism of David Harvey or a value form Marxism, which uh, some of those thinkers will respond by saying, well, uh, what are you talking about? Marx abolished philosophy and philosophers and bourgeois philosophers in his time. Um, out of curiosity, what, what might you say to, to such a provocation that, that you know, Marx, Marxism has an inbuilt hostility to philosophy, even though, of course, Marx says that philosophy must be the weapon of the proletarian. Mm -hmm. What would you say to a Marxist thinker like that who says, think, well, there's no place for philosophy and so on? I think it depends on what your relationship to the idea of philosophy is. If you construe philosophy as contemplative reflection, then this is correct. That uh, Marx is clear over and over again of his hostility to the bourgeois, um, atomistic, relationship to the world where reason can somehow stand outside of the world and reflect on it, understand it, and judge it. But what Marx is saying is that overcoming that kind of philosophy means entering into a new way of thinking where, in effect, um, and this is the air, this is again, this is the air to the importance of German idealism, and the left Hegelians that came after the death of Hegel, which is the idea that reason is realized in the world in concrete form. And this is the idea that is kind of developing itself in Nietzsche as early as, you know, um, probably as late as, as Kant's third critique and the critique of judgment, for sure, where he's making a distinction between reason as being regulative of experience in the world versus being constitutive of the world, or which he rejects, what he says is only about the aesthetic. Um, there are thinkers like Hödelin, the, the poet philosopher, who preceded Hegel's ideas in a lot of ways that Hegel learned a lot from his uh, precocious poet friend, um, and the reaction that said that reason and the world don't have to be t ripped from one another, that reason is in the world. And I think there's something that Marx is doing that continues to be a really important theory, which is that the world, just as much as our minds, are part of a unified structure. In that sense, philosophy has a new object. It's not, it's not the same activity. And I think that the idea is unified in this concept of praxis. Self-conscious praxis replaces what traditionally would have been understood as philosophy, contemplative, disengaged thought, which is an illusion, according to Marx, and I think that's true. Um, at the same time, that means that our relation to the world, even if it's praxic, can lose that self-conscious quality. We, can still, we are still objectively praxic beings. You and I are having a discussion right now on a computer made by other human beings who had ideas about how to put electronic parts together, etc. 
It's plugged into a wall that goes into a generator that goes into all these things, right? This is all human. This is all praxis. But it, that's not always self-conscious. So from thinkers like David Harvey and others that lean more on the other side of the Marxian pole, to, away from, and I don't think it's totally fair with David Harvey, um, but emphasizing less of consciousness and more the, the structure of political economy, that brings us into, I think, a different kind of alienation. Because even if it's true that you can understand the whole workings of the machine, it doesn't bring us anywhere politically, I believe. And I think Lukash saw this too. That it's what's important is that human beings realize themselves, consciously understand themselves as beings that make and remake the world. That's the ontological. So it's a kind of move away from pure materialism and incorporating the idea that human beings shape the world. And that what and that's something that we do whether we're aware of it or not. Every day people go to work and they take the subway or they a bus or a car and they do a job and they come home and feed their kids. And I don't think that they are self-consciously aware of like, what am I doing? What am I doing at work? What am I do raising my, why am I watching this television program? The idea that like the whole world is made according to certain purposes. That's the, that's where philosophy ex 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 kind of exert, reasserts itself. Mm -hmm. There has to be a sense where we we achieve self-consciousness mm. of ourselves as praxic beings. So in that way, we're not dealing with pure philosophy anymore. We're dealing with a philosophically informed way of acting and being in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is amazing. I mean, on our program, um, I have turned over the last few years uh, to the Lukacs of the destruction of reason and, and, you know, for the benefit of listeners, in short, he's, you know, he's thinking about this tradition of reason that you've invoked and he's making an argument that, um, Hegelian reason, uh, sort of completed something within the German idealist, uh, traditional philosophy, but that the contradictions of the capitalist bourgeois social order after 1848 were not capable of realizing that. And so it became a crisis within the intellectual world at the time. And then he makes this beautiful claim that, well, it was really the European and the global working class that had a kind of duty to continue the, the enactment of the Hegelian notion, which is one way to think about the passing of the torch from Hegel to Marx, that uh, the realization of the realm of ethical life, of, uh, of realm of freedom in the Hegelian sense is only realizable through Marx's imminent critique of capitalism. And um, that portends a very interesting vocation of any intellectual uh, in, in Lukács' view, in part because, yes, you still see the role of philosophy for proletarian subjectivity. So my question to you is, in your vision, how do you think, given that you're focused on consciousness and this Western Marxism tradition, how do you think in a contemporary milieu, in our era, the neoliberal era, how do you think class conflict and these, uh, because for Lukács, some of this question about the reintroduction of consciousness was thought through a revolutionary socialist uh, conception, which was reliant on a theory of the socialist party which was itself a workers' party. We lack that, unfortunately. We don't have access to something like that, a, a vehicle for the realization of such uh, in itself, for itself, dialectic, and so on. It's all reliant on that. It's a Leninist. Okay, we're in a post-Leninist milieu, I think it's fair to say. Some people may say they're still Marxist-Leninist, but to me, it doesn't really make sense. <laughs> in the same way that if you say you're a Maoist, okay, you can say that, but let's let's be a little more honest. So we're in a, a strange place organizationally. In that context, how might you, yeah, let, let's keep the emphasis on the question of class. How, how have you been, I know you've written a book on inequality, how, and I haven't read that, but um, help us introduce class, because it's a big focus of our of our program as well. So the I think um, the idea of, of 
reclaiming the concept of class in a post-industrial neoliberal context um, can be reshaped through understanding um, the ways that a lot of Marx's ideas um, are an extension of a kind of radical Republican political project. Um, Marx definitely is critical of bourgeois republicanism, liberal republicanism, but I would argue um, that Marx is deeply entwined with a structure of thought coming out of thinkers like Machiavelli and Rousseau and Hegel, um, where they saw the idea, they, th these, were, these are thinkers who were able to glimpse the idea that there's some fundamental, um, there's some fundamental purpose to the community, that the individual and the community are somehow dialectically related, that capitalism shatters, that capitalism continues a pathological form of relatedness and power where, as Rousseau talks about this in the second discourse on inequality, um, where we are basically enslaved for the benefit of the few. That, I, that is a continuation of, and, and, and Marx in Capital really delineates the ways that this process of conflict between classes can actually be metabolized into a total process. The very end of volume one um, is a discussion of the idea of real subsumption of labor, the subsumption of, of labor, where he talks about how, look, in the beginning, it's going to be look as a conflict. Capital is going to move in. It's going to start employing workers to, to do things. Workers are going to be like, I don't want to do this. This is horrible, but I have no choice. They're going to have a conflicted that conflictual attitude. Over time, um, they're going to be subsumed into the system itself, which means they're simply going to see it as a new second nature, a new reality. This is what Lukash is talking about with the problem of reification. The fundamental category, one of the many fundamental categories that comes out of history and class consciousness, because Lukash sees that like, it's changing. You can't rely on what people like Karl Kautsky or Rudolf Hilferding or the Austro-Marxists, the Orthodox Marxists of the late 19th, early 20th century. That was when you had large working class parties large labor parties that could win electoral parliamentary power and start to actually have a re have a reform from above movement that was revolutionary. Kautsky writes about this. We get power, we start socializing the economy. Weimar Republic, the, the first iterations of the Weimar Constitution also sought this. They're like, you know, there are limits to capital. It's going to be absorbed into the stru administrative structure of the state. The welfare state transition after 1945 in Western Europe and the United States has fundamentally transformed this. This is not, a Lukash of 1923 is not possible because the situation has so radically changed. A large middle class society was produced and it was produced for the benefit of consumption. Consumption was seen as the benefit to production, which was seen as the, as the kind of nest egg for a taxation welfare system that would make, that would reconcile everyone to the system. This has effectively eliminated class consciousness in any meaningful sense. A return to that, I believe, is going to require the idea of understanding the irrationality of the system, its set of crises, and a return to this early Marx, the early Marx, not, not ignoring or de-emphasizing capital in any way, but the idea of an awareness that, asks, that begins to ask people, um, you know, do you live a life that's really free? Do you live a life that's free or do you live a life that's filled with neurosis and psychosis, that's filled with stress and anxiety, that's filled with a declining public sector and public welfare, that you can look all around you and start to actually characterize the world as basically de-republicanizing itself. It's not there for the common interest of, of all. The commons is being completely looted and extracted. And there are Marxist thinkers that are returning to this language of the idea of the commons, of the idea of the proletariat being seen more in Machiavellian terms as like, you know, we've got to get rid of domination. Some access to this kind of political theoretic language is going to be necessary because the class 
structures politically and sociologically that were assumed all the way through the 19, mid 1960s, say, in Europe, they're gone. Yes, I think this is interesting because I have a, um, I took the Horkheimer Adorno position on the working class after the Second World War in their work on the culture industry for a long time as a kind of fait accompli or as correct. But, you know, subsequently after 2008, I have really begun to question the viability of the post-war Keynesian welfare state social contract. I think that neoliberalism has entered a fundamentally disciplinary era. I think there is some merit to the neo-feudal thesis. Mm -hmm. I think we have a profound crisis of social mobility. I think we have things like the deaths of despair. We have, but we have no way to articulate that. So there is a analog of, a, of the current uh, system of capitalism to the pre-1848 conditions. So yes, the early Marx is important. And I would only add, I don't know if you agree, that politically, yeah, you know, focusing on working class organization also also matters in, in that in that yes. situation. Um, but that that was just a side point. Um, let us return to your work. In the domestication of critical theory, um, which is an incredible uh, wide ranging critique of late Frankfurt School philosophy, Axel Hannes, Ergen Habermas, um, and several other thinkers you can mention perhaps, you provide a sort of um, uh, argument that there has been what you call a neo-idealist turn in critical theory. And your argument is very comprehensive. Could you just help us by laying out what you mean by that and giving us a kind of big picture. I know it's a complex argument, but perhaps you've done this before, giving us a big picture sense of how the late Frankfurt School and critical theory, Frankfurt School is kind of the engine of critical theory. It's taken on many different forms after that. How did it all kind of go awry in your view? I think it's related to the previous discussion we just had and what you've just pointed out, Daniel, about, uh, about the kind of Keynesian welfare state model. So I think under the way I see the story the, from just theoretical terms, um, the original Frankfurt School group really gets kind of cleaved into two. So there are the thinkers that kind of came, they all come to the United States. There's some of them stayed, some of them went back. Um, and generally speaking, I think the ones that went back um, left behind a sense of um, a, a sense of civic engagement and moved much more toward uh, conscious back to a philosophy of consciousness even though very Marxist and psychoanalytic and I think about Horkheimer and Adorno in particular you know Adorno's move toward aesthetic theory negative dialectics consciousness has to resist the total reification uh, everything's administered it's a Weberian nightmare and the only way, uh, the only possible solution is for the self, the individual, to resist it. And I think by the time you get to the death of Adorno, um, that Habermas is starting to, is, is already uncomfortable where, where, where this has ended up. And he sees that he wants, first of all, that he believes in coming out of the generation that he did at the end of the Nazi regime, that the importance of democracy is central, first of all, that democracy has to be given a firm rootedness so that this, so that what happened in 1933 doesn't happen again. But he also comes up with a philosophical kind of synthetic discovery through with his habilitation and the, on the public sphere, which is the, the theory of communication, the idea of reason. And I think the, the, the move that he makes in the 1970s to move toward what he calls communicative action, inevitably in the 80s, discourse ethics, is only possible because of the very social contract that you mentioned, that we just talked about before. In other words, part of the assumption is, this is particularly after he wrote the book, Legitimation Crisis, is the idea like, wait a minute, capitalism isn't what it was in 1920. It's not the satanic mills anymore. We have an administered 
you know, this is, by the way, Friedrich Pollock's famous paper um, from the 19, four, early 40s called uh, State Capitalism, where he comes up and he says, look, the world's changed. It's not a market economy anymore. The political, the administrative state basically tinkers and manages with everything. So the economic era of capitalism is over, and now we're in a bureaucratic, administrative, political form of capitalism. I'm going to think of James Burnham here too, managerial revolution. Yes, yes. And, and by the way, exactly. And a lot of American uh, uh, standard political science in the 1950s was reiterating this. I mean, all the way through the 60s, through, uh, um, you know, uh, Galbraith's uh, New Industrial State from 66, I think that book is, um, Henry Cariel's work, a whole bunch of work from the 50s and 60s was reiterating this idea like, okay, capitalism is no longer a distinctly economic phenomenon. It's been absorbed into the state. And I think with Habermas, it was like, okay, wait a minute. Marx doesn't seem as important anymore. We don't really have to look at capitalism because it's been absorbed into the state. Um, and he said he believes that Marx's structural, functional kind of way of looking at society, that that model doesn't really work anymore either. That we have to, there's another aspect of human consciousness, which is, and which is always, always there around us, which is through communication and discourse. And that's where we have to focus because look, the capital... Problems of capitalism have effectively, they haven't been completely solved, but the only way you're going to solve it now is through a political program that's thoroughly democratic, that reaches self, that consciousness, and unites some of these great themes from German idealism. Theory and practice, language. How could you, how could you, language is, for, for Habermas, intrinsically, it's an action, it's a social act, right? It's a speech act, according to Searle. So it's praxis and it's, it's, it's thought and action at the same time. And he comes up with this idea that says, look, all of us doing this together can be, this can be formulated in the way of exploding reification, overcoming um, a kind of alienated form of thought. This is what he tries to do in the two volumes of the theory of communicative action, because the second volume almost is entirely dedicated to the problem of reification. And by the time the 80s come around, it's a full-fledged intellectual paradigm for the Institute of Social Research. And it gets a feedback effect back here in the States. So people are translate from, from the 70s, journals like Telos are translating Adorno and Lukash. In the 80s, the trend, the, it starts to become academically fashionable and acceptable because we're just talking about discourse now. And it's a, it's a, there's a kind of radicalism that's safe because it can happen in the seminar room. Added, added to which you have the French uh, turn to discourse in Lacan, in Foucault, and in Althusser, which, and this, which, yes. which uh, creates a, it's a, a similar position apropos uh, uh, the, the question of the transcendence of capitalism. I mean, they were, they were formulating their theories in a revolt against Marxism as an ism, French theory was. And as you say, I think to some extent Habermas was as well, although he's leaning more on this uh, democratic, civic uh, model. The French are a little, as the French are, <laughs> much more radical. But then, of course, are they really radical? Because, you know, what, what, they, what they end up doing kind of, um, to me, in my, uh, as I see it, sort of missed out on the kind of trajectory that capitalism ended up taking in the mm -hmm. neoliberal turn. Anyways, I'm jumping ahead. Please. No, no. Going. And actually, that's a really interesting point, because I think what what made Habermas even more important in that respect, with respect to what was happening in the discursive turn in France, and there's also a linguistic turn in philosophy, in uh, analytic philosophy in England and the United States, going back earlier to Wittgenstein, but it really takes on a new life you know, in the 50s and 60s with thinkers like Searle. Um, and I think what Habermas did maintain, what kept him tethered to critical theory was his tie to the Enlightenment tradition. That reason has to be, it's not enough for reason to resist. And I think that's Foucault. That's the French, that's the legacy of the French kind of uh, discursive movement was that Foucault is more about resistance than he is about transformation. And I think what, what Habermas is saying is that Habermas's belief, which I believe is naive, 
is the idea that pragmatic discourse between individuals can actually transform consciousness. It can do what psychoanalysis does in the, in, in, in the dyad. It can do socially. That's something he says in Knowledge and Human Interests. It's this idea like, well, look, the better, the better idea, I mean, this is crude, but the better idea is going to win because you, you f suddenly realize that it has no validity. And validity is the agreement of many members talking and discoursing in a public sphere. And that was, that's, I think that's, that's part of what made, but, you know, there's still a leg in the radical idea, which says like, you know, um, unlike John Rawls, for example, where it's everyone has their own um, sphere of beliefs and only those things that overlap are really political. Everyone else can have their own beliefs about religion or the good life. And I think Habermas is saying, no, everyone, you know, it, everything has to be questioned. And that way he's still tethered to that Marxian idea of like the ruthless critique of everything. Mm -hmm. But I do think it's, it's the story. The story kind of takes this turn away from the critique of capital because the idea was basically, I think, believe, the belief was, and by the way, anyone who travels to Europe regularly, I mean, I just came back from Frankfurt from a mm -hmm. conference at the university. And every time I go to Germany, I go to Germany a couple of times a year, a year, you know, they really, you know, you realize this is not the United States, you know, like mm. the, the, the trains run properly, things, mm. the cities are clean, there aren't people sleeping on the streets mm. and things aren't as good now as they were in the 70s and 80s, for example, in terms of the power of the, of the mm. welfare state and redistributive mechanisms. Mm. So when you come here, you're like, no, this is this is capital tooth and claw. Yeah. You no, know, and so you can see why someone like Habermas or Hanit were like, look, we need to talk about gender. We need to talk about inclusion. We need to talk right. about how do we include other people. And that's not wrong. Right. In any way. Right. But it took the eye off the ball in critical theory. Yeah. And when neoliberalism hit, all the resources needed for a sophisticated critique of capital. We're out of reach for a, new, for a yeah. whole new generation. Yeah, and that's why I say that critical theory got domesticated. It is interesting, though, as a side point, how significant for both the French and the Germans the Marshall Plan was in in a type of paternalism, which even the Frankfurt School and the French, I mean, there's a whole way of reading 68 in France yeah. Yeah. as a paternalist post-colonial revolt against the Marshall Plan, which was a kind of revolt against the Americanization of capitalism being put on the French. When you look about it, when you think about it that way, that changes so, so much of the dynamics. And it's also a great irony that now America has become, though, well, I guess in some sense you can make an argument that it's always been part of America to have this kind of wild, uncouth capitalism. But at the time, I think the Frankfurt School thinkers did have to, um, which is part of the reason why Adorno didn't care if he's being published in journals funded by the CIA, because he had already uh made a certain pessimistic uh resignation in some sense and and of course i think it bears mentioning that nietzsche becomes so important in that pessimist resignation of course right which is why the dialectic of enlightenment has a very interesting grappling with the irrationalist philosophy which for Lukács would be would be a disaster. And it's one of the largest chapters in the destruction of reason. Is the chapter on Nietzsche? Yeah. So, um, so, but to return to the neo idealism question, so they have a conception of norms and of 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 recognition. So it's kind of both neo Kantian and neo Hegelian. But your argument is that. Um, recognition, the, the way in general that these, and I'm summarizing, so you correct me if I'm wrong, the way that these philosophers summarize recognition is actually ultimately problematic. Um, talk about why the philosophies of recognition, of course, a lot of Marxists will point out that Hegel must be taken beyond merely a thinker of, of recognition because that's not changing the material substrate of social reality, social relations, and so on. Is that sort of what you're getting at here with this with this point? And and well, also what where are they coming at apropos recognition? So I the idea of recognition is a really, really important one. And I think it it's 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 in Marx's early writings, 
from 1842 and 1843. Um, it's very different from what we see emerging um, in critical theory now, and even outside of critical theory with recognition. Um, it's in Rousseau. It's in a whole bunch of writings. It's in object relations theory and psychoanalysis. It's in, it's, it's in Freud, um, Kohut. So it, it, there's a whole series of places where recognition, recognition is a fundamental idea that underpins Hegel's really robust, radical idea that the mind is distributed, that the mind is social, that the mind is not monadic as it is in Hobbes and Kant. It is, it is intersubjective. It is a result of interdependence with the interdependence we have on others. And it's very, it's, re, and it's so, there's a robust way of understanding recognition. My, my critique is specifically the idea that recognition can serve as a source, as a paradigm for, for, for a critical social theory. And the reason for this is that it that it that it cannot that it is not it true. cannot do that it has the it, it's and this is Honneth's basic claim that and 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 in the writings throughout the eighties and through the nineties and even through today he maintains Marx is not a part of critical this is over you've got to get over it and he's he's I mean he can get irascible about this personally um like he's absolutely insistent that Marx not be a part of critical theory. And I think the reason is that he believes that is a that is a paradigm that is part of the 19th century and it's gone and we have to move on. That Habermas broke the back of Marxism and showed that it's it's use it's effectively useless and what we need to do is move toward what what they call the post metaphysical paradigm. The idea that our minds are communicative but and and, and what Hanet does is deepen Habermas's more epistemic idea, say so communication, says, no, we're thicker beings than just thinking beings that epistemically relate to one another. We also affectively relate to others. We actually, there is something that goes back to early childhood about how we relate to others that serves as a fundamental paradigm of, of consciousness, of recognition, which we can see it being disturbed, blocked pathologically distorted and that is the source of critical theory of society because now we're now we're freed from the moorings of capital critique because now i could be misrecognized based on my ethnicity my gender my sexuality on on, on whatever you know a scriptive category that we wanted so it's inclusive of this and the problem really becomes i think is when you start thinking about it in terms of the world we really live in which is, you know, it's politically completely, I think, ineffective. The Nazi doesn't care if you recognize them or not. And recognition can happen within communities that, are, that don't want to recognize people outside of them. I'm sure white supremacist groups have real tight recognitive relations with one another that are very effectively bonded. But it's not giving them critical consciousness with respect to, you know, is our political platform you know, you uh, irrational or anti-democrat. They don't care, and I think the, re the, the you, what happens and and the biggest problem of all is, is that of reification. That reification can bleed into, and this 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 is a global critique of the neo of neo idealism. That reification bleeds into the category, the very categories that we use when we discourse with one another, when we communicate with one another, when we seek to recognize one another, there's no intrinsically disruptive force if we only rely on discourse, communication, recognition, or what other things, justification, or all these other kinds of uh, offshoots of the post-metaphysical. Mm -hmm. And that's why the return to Marx, not just Marx, but Hegelian Marxism, mm -hmm. the structure of thought that says, wait a minute, is there a, is there a, a ground for critique? Is there a ground for judgment? And that's what I tried to do in my book, The Spectre of Babel, which was lay out a kind of com coming from that tradition and say, look, we need to understand that there have to be objective ways of understanding the good, mm. the just, and freedom. It's not simply, a, it's not a post-metaphysical category. You need to return to metaphysics. Metaphysics as an understanding of being. Right. 
And that Hegel, the left Hegelians, and Marx give to us. And I think those thinkers from the critical theory tradition that hook us into that, there's a lot of places where Adorno does this in his lectures on sociology and his lectures on, on, so, on society, where he really talks about this. But there are people, thinkers like Eric Fromm, mm. who try to develop this idea in Man for Himself and other and the same society, where he says, like, look, human beings, there's an objective way of understanding what a free life could be. Yeah. And this returns us to what you, you were mentioning before, Daniel, with the um Hegel's idea of ethical life. Yes. This idea of the concretization of the conceptual, that it must move from consciousness into the world and back again, that circuit. And right. that's something that he's trying to do in the section on recognition in the phenomenology. Because mm -hmm. it's not just that the master and the slave recognize each other. The slave goes out to work. The slave works for the master. Mm -hmm. This is all cut off mm -hmm. in the recapitulation in post-metaphysical critical theory. But the idea is like, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the slave, the servant who goes out to work the world. To, to actually humanize raw nature. And it's only, and, and, and that's where that moment of, of, of recognition and alienation and just, just you know, the, this, this separation from what's human, that's where it really happens. Mm. And I think this is, a, this, this is also something that Rousseau talks about, where he says the origin of inequality really is when one person found it would be better to have enough for two and found other people to basically give it to him, work for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he had more than he needed, mm -hmm. surplus. Mm -hmm. So the idea and the norms, going back to that really quickly, you need, for this kind of a system to work, to tell people, go out, work yourself to death for nothing, and you'll probably be fired, and I don't care if your kids die and you live in a parking lot in a car. There's only one way, short of real compulsion, which was real feudalism, which was like, do it or we kill you, mm -hmm. um, which is... Um, make you believe in the system. Yeah. I have to do it. I have no choice. And that that is material. It's true. There are material structures that make it necessary. But there's also a transformation of norms, ideology, alienated consciousness mm -hmm. that make us give, as limp as it may be, some legitimacy to the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the recognition and communication fail. Because you can have a vigorous debate about whether to raise taxes on corporations. Mm. And there are many people who might say like, no, because I'm scared that they're going to take the jobs out of the town. Mm. So what is that? How does that, how does that get us to the structural level? Yeah. Now Habermas, is, Habermas has a whole series of answers about how that could happen, but it becomes a smaller and smaller segment of the population. You start realizing it looks just like those of us that teach at university. Yeah. And it's like, okay, so how do you, how do you actually create a true political subjectivity, mm -hmm. a true group political subjectivity that will be capable of transformative politics and consciousness? Yeah, and this, in a sense, draws a, draws us curiously to the work of the later the later Lukács, which um, I really want to turn to now. I think it's a good time to do so because, in a strange way, perhaps it's not strange. Uh, so, just briefly for for listeners, Lukács. Um, his his sort of final period of his of his work uh, formulates what's called the Budapest School, and there's actually a number of thinkers that come from the Budapest School, which um, like Mesaros um, and and others who are much very uh, Agnes Heller, who are they're not that well known. And there's several others which I'm planning to introduce more because I think what was developed there remains like you know if this Foucauldian Habermasian tradition doesn't speak to our present. Uh, somehow Lukács does. Why does he speak to our present? Might it have to do with the fact that his later turn to uh, social ontology, uh, the ontology of social being, the three-part unfinished books, which I invite you to say something about, uh, is already itself not accepting any post-metaphysical conception of, of social reality. And nor is it, it's trying to sort of uh, grapple with how do we create the foundation of the realization of freedom mm -hmm. from a Marxist point of view. So unpack a little bit about that, starting off with um, what you find most compelling in the later period of Lukács. 
and then you speak more broadly uh, about his contributions there. I, it's it's a huge undertaking. Um, you know, Lukash, um, the two volumes in German um, that were published in 1986 really were assembled from um, a, a really early, unfinished kind of work. In German, there are two large, thick volumes uh, called Toward an Ontology of Social Being. And there's a really wonderful uh, prolegomena that he wrote that was translated um, that kind of summarizes the argument that um, that it kicks it off. And there's also a paper that he gave in Vienna in 1956, um, which was translated, it's kind of a precis of the whole argument, which was translated in the philosophical forum, I think in the 1970s. Um, all, all these resources are very underutilized because I think by the time, by 1986, Lukács' fashion was no longer really fashionable. His high time in the, in the West was really as a literary critic in the 1950s and 60s, and as a philosopher only later in the 70s, because history and class consciousness wasn't translated until 71. But, you know, uh, among the papers that were kind of scattered around after his death were some notes, and um, on one of them was found, he scribbled this phrase in German, which said, uh, um, no ethics without an ontology, kind of ethic on ontologia. And I, I always found this to be very compelling because what I think Lukács was trying to do was go back to the foundation, the philosophical foundations of Marxism, not to the political economy, but to the underlying philosophical anthropology that Marx had laid out that was also tied to the left, left Hegelians and to, to Hegel and to try to, ex to try to make that a foundation for Marxist philosophy. Why? Because he believed that Marx, just as he did in 1923, I think, that he believed that Marxism needed a theory of judgment. He needed a, it needed a theory of, of ethics. What is, because I think he saw this, Lukács is obviously a supporter of, of Eastern European communism, he's a supporter of the Soviet Union, um, until, and, and the Stalinist phase of that he saw as a kind of temporary phase necessary to protect the kind of Bonapartist phase that, um, but he also saw in it the bureaucratic phase that he was, that he saw this, these were contradictions that it had to defend against fascism. But after that, he realized he did see that this heavy bureaucratization was not realizing the promises of socialism. In the 1956 uh, uprising against the Soviets, um, which gets crushed, uh, Lukács is banned from teaching because he supported the uprising. He supported the democratic uprisings of 1968 because he wanted to democratize socialism. So we saw the socialist project as incomplete, that the Soviet system was a distorted version of what so the promises, the humanistic promise of socialism. So I believe that the ontology was written because in volume two, which never been translated into English, is a huge chapter on alienation. And he basically suggests that alienation happens under communism just as much as it does under capitalism. So there's this idea that says, okay, we need something, we need something bigger. And what we need is a way of understanding human beings, human being that's social. And I think this is part of what I argue in my kind of interpretations of where we, where Marxist philosophy needs to go from here, because it's also responding to, just as a footnote, to Jean-Paul Sartre's uh, critique of dialectical reason, the volume one, which came out in 1960, which is also offering an ontology rooted in Marx, Marxist terms. But Lukács doesn't find this to be enough because they both, I think Sartre and Lukács share the idea that human beings are teleological beings, which is Marx's, which, which he, he believes that Marx has made this transition, that the, the most important transition from Hegel to Marx philosophically was to take teleology from being a historical 
kind of uh, phenomenon or structure that, you know, reason's going to realize itself behind our backs through the world and to make it actually an anthropological part of the human, of human being. So, you know, back again to Marx, it's like you pick up a pen and realize this was an idea in someone's head that gets realized through the actual manipulation of, of the physical world. So that that's the way that idealism and materialism get dialectically sublated into ontology, into the a study of being, of ontos. And he believes that labor, this is the, his concept of labor, the idea of what he calls in the book teleological positing, that what we do, even when we're talking to one another, this is why it says it's not just about physical labor out on the farmland or like working in a factory, labor as praxis, that I am talking to you now and I'm moving my mouth to actually move sound waves in a particular way because there's an idea that I want to communicate to you. This is labor. This falls under the category of labor, just as it is making a book or making a meal or going to the factory, that's alienated labor, right? So it brings into the question, if we're teleological beings, that means we produce purposes in the world. We produce things in the world together. We're relational beings. We need one another, but we also produce things in the world. And that mean, that immediately brings into question, what are we producing in the world? Why are we doing it? What is the good of this? And that opens up a whole structure of thought where critique is accessible to everyone, I believe. And it gives substantive content to the neo-idealist claims about formalism. In other words, just let people talk it out and figure it out. It's like, you can't. Lukash knows there has to be substance. We're talking about something. We're to and so de-reifying consciousness, even though he never uses this term in his later writings, um, is still important. We have to see human beings for what they are. And that returns to what I, idea I was talking about before. How do we restore self-consciousness mm -hmm. to praxis? This is, this is really, really remarkable, um, Michael, insofar as Lukács is sort of put in a corner or in a box as a vulgar Stalinist who, uh, in fact, thought that well, communism is the end of reification. I've actually heard um, Andrew Feinberg say something like this. Mm -hmm. There's a danger of the late Lukács because he abandons reification. Well, that's that's crazy. Well, he doesn't abandon alienation. He abandons reification, I think. Yeah, how does that work? So I, so I think the problem really is, I, I think the idea that he held to in 1923 was this idea that, what he, I think what he was trying to avoid was this the kind of Adorno, this cul-de-sac. That if if you see reification in the workplace, you're going to see it everywhere. And when you see it everywhere, it's going to kill agency. There's going to be no possible... And, and I think for Adorno, that's clear. I mean, he even says it. Praxis is dead. You know, it's... Forget it. And that's why he has these debates with, like, Hans-Jürgen Kral and these, you know, that the 68 student generation in, at... at at, at the at Frankfurt Goethe University, where they're saying like, no, you need praxis, and he's like, you don't get it. Praxis is over; it's done. This is all you've got left. You need to defend. You need to defend yourself against reification. So I think Lukash, in in that second volume, when he talks about the alienation, he's like, no, people can be alienated. They can be alienated from the things that they produce in the world. It doesn't mean they're necessarily reified. It doesn't mean because reification is more than alienation. Reification really is an infection of consciousness that makes you unaware that the rules of your mind and categories of thought are really rooted in the world outside of you. So I think what, what Lukács thinks is that socialism, you know, the age of socialism that he lived in was not complete. It needed democratic democratic character. He writes a whole series of essays on, on democracy. And he writes a whole series of papers and popular articles in Hungarian that have been translated um, by Haymarket in a single volume where he talks about uh, civic life and literature as a, as a means of civic life. So for Lukács, aesthetics is really the means to explode reification. 
realism. And this is another place where the distortions of Luke are really so people are like, oh, so you're gonna see a bunch of people singing on a tractor, and then that's that's realism. Where he has a very sophisticated yeah. idea about the the role that art can play by showing by bringing people face to face with the horror of the world that they live in. Mm -hmm. And that this is that this is going to impact them to say to kind of not have them be folded into the world. So I do think there's a sense where Lucas is like, no, there's a, through aesthetics, even through film. You know, he has the two volume that yep. he did complete before he died on aesthetic, which has not been trans. Well, I think it's in the process of it, being. It, yeah, I think it's actually just come out. Correct. Perhaps. Correct. I have to correct myself on it, that because with I know purple materialism. If I'm not mistaken. Correct. You're right about that. But for a long time, this was this was left untrans. He has a theory of film. He has a theory of music in there. Uh, he has the idea of aesthetics as a, as a signal system of yeah. communication. It's it's incredibly sophisticated aesthetic. But I think that I think he believed that there were these means that people had, yeah, them where reification wouldn't become total. But that doesn't mean you can't be alienated, right? Yeah, there's this funny uh, anecdote as a side point an interview. You can find it on YouTube with is it George Steiner, the the literary mm. critic? Yes, George Steiner. Yeah, uh, who was a friend, a friend of Lukács. Yes. He was a liberal. He was a liberal. He was not mm -hmm. a communist. Uh, but they they would meet and they were close and so on. Both Jewish intellectuals and so on. And uh, he says that uh, it was this uh, uh, really prominent film called Blue Angel is the title. I haven't seen it myself, but it was. Um, the only film that Lukács ever went to see in the theater. Mm. And um, uh, Steiner said, well, no, and then Steiner was at his desk and he saw, he, he saw a text on film theory. And he asked Lukács, how could you write a text on film theory when you've only been to one film? And then Lukács' response was, well, when Aristotle wrote the poetics, he had only seen one play. He had only seen um, Oedipus. Yeah. Then, and then Steiner says, and this is in a posthumous interview. One film was enough for Lukács to create. <laughs> it's, it's a funny anecdote, uh, but it gives a sense of his towering uh, intellect, I guess. Your thoughts on the destruction of reason, please. You, uh, it's a controversial book in Marxism, uh, Western Marxism especially. Adorno famously said, has said he wanted nothing to do with the text. Is it... Um, smeared with a Stalinist agenda in your view, or is, do you find the text, how do you find it? I think it's, it's always been a book that, uh, you know, when I first discovered it, I was a graduate student and it was kind of, this was like the high point of the postmodern assault on in the enlightenment um, in political theory and philosophy and social theory. And at the time, I found the book to be an incredible pivot point because it's going through, the, the, you know, the kind of, um, especially that, that that large chapter on Nietzsche, which I think is just a, a critique of all postmodernism in Nietzsche. You know, it's just, it's a very sophisticated, I think, uh, critique of the irrationalism. And the need and the yearning for that irrationalism, the reason why it, why there's that yearning in the bourgeoisie for for, for this, as he sees this in, you know, Thomas Mann and, and Budenbrooks and these novels where uh, the Magic Mountain, where there are these thinkers that move to the Enlightenment, there are these characters that move toward the, toward it, toward the uh, unrational, irrational. I think Budenbrooks is the character that's always reading Schopenhauer, right? You know, so there's like this idea, he sees these tensions within bourgeois life. But I think, to me, the most important idea that is defended in that book is the idea that reason is linked with praxis. I mean, he actually, I forget the exact sentence, but it basically it's an equivocation that says any deviation from the idea that reason isn't united with praxis um, is, is when you fall into irrationality. Mm. And it may not be Nietzschean, you know, irrationality, it could also be a, like he has Zimmel in there. Yeah. So you think like, what? Do you have to get Zimmel and Nietzsche together? Mm -hmm. Well, you do because in the sense of like you think you are understanding the world in mm -hmm. a particular way, mm -hmm. but you never understand. So, for example, you know, Zimmel's whole pessimistic theory of culture, the tragedy mm -hmm. of culture thesis, where it's mm -hmm. like the individual is going to be completely outrun by the collective techno kind of 
you know, this is, and this is just the, this is the movement of history. This is the movement of modernity. And there's nothing you can do about it. And Weber says the same thing. Yes. You know, the iron cage of history. Right. Or the steel, you know, the steel cage. And Lukács sees this as like, this is all different parts of the spectrum of a continuum of different levels of irrationality. Right. Because they, they, whether you are the individual raging, uh, you know, against the system, or you're sitting back from the hotel abyss, looking at it all happen. Right. You're all you're disengaged from the idea, like this can be changed. Correct. This can be changed, and that's the true rational. Part. Everything that deviates from that is a different degree mm. of irrationality, mm. and more the idea that you can change the world into something that it really can't be changed into. Yeah, or that the class struggle has a um, rationality which is graspable by the community of intellectuals. That's right. That's, That's one right. Of the, the the most damaging claims of irrationalism, which frankly, the Hotel Abyss and Frankfurt School kind of adopts. Yeah, they kind of do. Absolutely. Now, now, now as we said earlier, there are valid reasons to question the agency of the industrial proletariat after the second world war, but that's a different claim. Well, let me, let me say, I actually yeah. think before the second world war, because it's like Eric Fromm who actually, you know, does this large scale study of the attitudes of the German working class and finds out like, you know, like 30% of these people are basically fascists. They have authoritarian character, but we need to think about this. Horkheimer rejected the publishing the study, but, you know, when this came out in the 80s in English, you know, it was suddenly seen like this is what we find um, in most mainstream social psychological studies of the population in general, which is like a huge percentage which have authoritarian attitudes and character structures. Yeah, but this this. OK, so this is helpful. I mean, one of the problems that we have with this, just as a side point, I mean, we were just doing a program I was interviewed on. Um, Andre Gortz's famous Farewell to the Working Class. Right. In, in that book, it's symptomatic of what you're saying. What you find there is any conception of a return to the proletariat that would be centering the working class. Well, you know, the problem with that is that you, you're going you're gonna to end up with a fascistic thing. So, so there's, we can't really talk about leadership amongst working class socialists. And therefore, we shouldn't even do working class parties. Mm -hmm. Kind of abandon all that. And you get a quite liberal uh, conception that becomes overly um, cognitive, uh, psychologistic uh, theory of authority that I think has a kind of connects us to some of your critiques of neo idealism. Have you done much research on this regarding the psychic theory of authority and um, coming out of Frankfurt School that um, and how it might land today? Have you, out of curiosity, I don't know if you've studied this or written. So I, you know, I, um, my other life is, and I work as a psychoanalyst um, at a clinic in, here in New York City. And um, studying psychoanalysis for many years has been really helpful because it really did kind of bring out in more textured relief the differences within critical theory about how they accessed psychoanalysis. Marcuse, Fromm, Adorno, Horkheimer, right? All of them are different places in the continuum. And actually, I still think that Fromm got this right the, 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 in terms of its nuance, that there's something happening as opposed to, say, the repression of sexuality, which was the core of orthodox Freudian thinking that Marcuse shared and Horkheimer and Adorno, um, particular study of the authoritarian personality that Fromm actually sees things very differently as relationally, as 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 the result of how our relations with others are being distorted and shaped. There's a sense where neoliberal capitalism, in particular, has so alienated our us from each other that it's created so many psychological issues um, that and it's created a certain kind of ego structure that you can see kind of pattern throughout the society. One which is racked with anxiety, one that is alienated, feels meaningless, purposeless, powerless. And whenever you have that, that character structure, that kind of ego structure, I think what happens is you're going to yearn for symbiotic relatedness to others. When this manifests itself on the right, 
you get ethno-nationalism, you get the kind of Trumpist neo-fascism. I mean, Trump is a great example because Cathexis to the leader is like all over the place. I mean, they think he's like the second coming of Christ or something. On the left, you get identity politics at the exclusion of class. The idea that the I, I that my ident I need to see my identity so mirrored in others that I'm going to be so dedicated to this part of the group, and I have to destroy anything that's going to threaten this. And so, and and this is very different from the kind of you know. One way of looking at the difference between like Plato and Aristotle, a little crude, but is Plato's emphasis on eros versus Aristotle's emphasis on philia, right? That we have civic, philic relatedness since like we're solidarism. This is very different from the need for the other to fill the lack that I have. And I think, so what society is doing, and Fromm got this right, I believe, his theory of sadomasochism, you know, because the masochists basically feel so alone that they'll give themselves up to the group or the other as long as they don't leave. The sadist will hurt the other so that they don't leave and feel alone. I think that dimension is really powerful in, in our society and it needs to be there as an adjunct to what people like Lukash were talking about with theories of reification and theories about praxis because Lukash you know, is not a psychoanalytically informed thinker. But the Frankfurt School theorists were in their way. And I think there has to be a return to how we integrate psychoanalysis back into critical theory, mm -hmm. because um, it's not enough to simply talk about recognition in Winnicott in some kind of offhand way and say like, okay, we've got this, I got myself grounded in Hegel, I got myself grounded in Winnicott. It's like, no, this doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, I agree. This is part of the reason why I find insight from thinkers in the psychoanalytic vein who tend to, well, who, who are falsely called conservative, but they're more difficult to categorize. Mainly, I mean, Christopher Lash and Philip Reeve, right. who argue that the leftist psychoanalytic method of Wilhelm Reich, which sought to destroy repression as praxis, ended up planting the seeds for a kind of pre-Oedipal subjectivity that capitalism and its kind of what the Lacanians call drive-based capitalism which is a kind of pure theory of irrationalist capitalism, mm -hmm. which is threatening to kind of overwhelm the autonomy of human desire and the individual right. and so on. Uh, well, the irony is, and I think this is true of a lot of new left philosophies that came out of the sexual revolution that were leaning on Wilhelm Reich, because if you read The Triumph of the Therapeutic by Philip Reif, who's the big enemy? Oh, it's, mm -hmm. definitely, mm -hmm. it, it's definitely Wilhelm Reich. Mm -hmm. But if you read Deleuze and Guattari, who's the hero? It's Wilhelm Reich. So uh, I've been very interested in that because I think that Fro I think that Reef and the Lash take on Freud as an anti-political thinker has merit, where so insofar as what Freud is really offering is this kind of cure for bourgeois subjectivity to kind of maintain its hegemony. And the renegade left-wing Freudians like Reich are misunderstanding that a society that has torn down all ego ideals is tearing down prohibition. And when you do that, you're in a post-repressive society. And I also think that the Lacanians are right that we are kind of in a post-repressive society. And that explains this crisis of authority. But just to go back to your point. Well, um, let me just add one quick thing no, to that, because I want you to continue. But I don't think we're living in a in a post-repressive society. I think what we are repressing is the very ontology that Lukács is actually sketching out. We're repressing ourselves our, as related, creative, meaning-making beings. And that's and it's being displaced by a reified idea of the self as what, you know, oral, consumptive, um, sexually you know, genito-centered sexuality, as opposed to what Marcuse talks about, you know, the kind of idea that that's actually repressive, that's actually repressive, that when, only when Eros is able to spread throughout and we're able to see ourselves as creative, spontaneous beings, then we're actually getting somewhere. But I think this is true, what you say about right, what you say about the idea of the pre-Oedipal yeah. aspects. Of yeah, the, the praxis was centered 
on furthering polymorphous perversity. Correct. Correct. Right. Right. And capitalism has shown in the same way that capitalism treats an institution such as the family, that it's that it's capable of destroying. And I think Horkheimer's text on the family is is important here. It's capable of destroying the ideals which in a paradoxical way, we as Marxists look back and say, actually, we need to resurrect and remind people of the ideals of the bourgeois family, right. which actually had highly, uh, I don't know the right word, noble or quite of um, necessary authority injunctions imparted in them so as that they fostered a more rational subject. And a more radical subject. A subject and a more radical because, subject. Because, uh, because yeah. the Oedipal subject at least has to revolt against the father. The Oedipal subject at least says, like, this is authority. I must confront it. It's in all the novels. It's in all the Bildungsroman and of the of the of the of the of the period. And it's something that was taken as 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 assumption. Of course, of course, this is also highly authoritarian, highly highly oppressive, as well as suppressive, and and fostered repression. Um, but there is a sense where. You know, and this is what I try to talk about in my book, Twilight of the Self, because there's a sense where what capital has been able to do is reach in for the first time, I think, and this is probably in the past 20 years. I would say this is a very new phenomenon that capital has been able to get at those psychic structures from practically from birth. That you, there is no longer a protected sphere, familial or otherwise, where we'll gradually introduce you into the world of the culture industry. That it's being, it's so penetrated us that the ego structure requisite for critical reflection doesn't exist. And I'm not saying this merely ego structure in terms of rationality, but also the character structure, the way that desire, the way that emotion, the way that um, hope or aspiration um the ideals that we to toward that, that we connect toward that all of that's been disrupted mm. so in some ways people born after 1999 or 2000 you're probably going to see a kind of gradual dissipation of that character structure mm -hmm. because they've been so infused and that's what you see in a lot of left movements now yeah yeah, it's almost taking Marx's premonition that capitalism in its financial period in his later work um, fosters what he calls the development of the socialized individual. Yeah. And you could read that in a positive, not positive, but in a dialectical way as, well, the task is to sort of accelerate that process of socialization. But I think what you're pointing out is that there's something about that socialization of the fact that right now we have a war going on in the Middle East, where we are connected to this kind of cyborg system mm -hmm. in a very strange way, where we're sort of thrown in emotionally in this hyper connectivity. But talk talk a bit about this notion, I think this will connect us back to the social ontology question of, yeah, this is a type of individualism that we deal with. Talk about its inadequacy and talk about the ways in which the social dimension can be re- Rediscover because it's not to say that we don't, we have we have way too much sociality or we have the wrong kind of sociality. But why is it wrong? Perhaps is one way to ask the question. Well, I I I think it's a question about again going back to From for a minute. It's a question about what are the drives impelling you toward the other, um, and I think there's a you know Marx I think took it somewhat for granted in a certain way that you know that. Um, I mean, it does make the distinction between the proletariat and the, the lumpen proletariat, right? There are there are people that just do not have, from Marx's view, there are people who are able to enter into solidaristic we thinking about about not only themselves as a class, but themselves as social beings in the society needs to be changed, versus others who just can't do this. And I think there's a sense where, and going back to that discussion about subsumption that Marx talks about. Because in Twilight of the Self, I talk about this idea of the subsumption of the self, of the self being subsumed into a particular type of sociality that capital wants. Um, and that's a really different thing than the kind of spontaneous 
social socialization that Marx would have witnessed, say, on the working class and the shop floor, where people are like, yeah, this is what, you know, people would form relatedness with each other. It was still an organic place that would get regimented by, by production process. But there's another step to this, which is now in post-industrial society where our, you know, we seek out other, not everyone, but there's a tendency to seek out the group to prop up the weakened self, to prop up the weakened ego, and kind of what Fromm calls group narcissism. It's because of my withered, because of the withered ego, because of the self that's that lacks and has been, you know, uh, deprived, that you need surplus recognition, that you need uh, you need identity to hold cohesion together in a world that's effectively meaningless, that no longer has those ego ideals or self objects that are able to kind of structure and give coherence to a self. So now you've got the danger, like, if I don't hold this together, I'm going to come apart. My whole sense of being is going to unravel. So I have to hold on to something, my identity, for example, any, whatever it may be. And I need to overinvest in that identity because there really is no broader culture left anymore. There are mm -hmm. no careers where, I mean, there are some, but quickly we see that, uh, you know, being a teacher, being a doctor being any, almost any anything you go into mm. um, is quickly being wiped out and young people see this much more than anyone else because they're on the other side of this mm. and i think there's a that's where the dialectic can come into play it's like wait a minute is this the what's the purpose of all this mm. why is this does it have to be this way mm. when you when you and i think that's where the ontology of social being of lukash but also the, the whole ontological project coming out of marxism is important because it brings the question back, like, what the hell are we doing? Right. Why are we doing this? Mm. Is this meaningful? Who who has the power to impose their projects on me? Mm. Once that question gets opened up, then you have the possibility for for real radical change, consciousness, right. and transformation. Right. And which is which is powerful because I mean we were just invoking the notion that for a lot of critical theory, the task was to resist forms of power. And in your, and, and then if you are socialist, it tended to be a libertarian form of socialism, which you see, I think is a very dominant uh, expression of socialism in the neoliberal era. And I think that you do run a risk of falling into what Mark Fisher calls capitalist realism. Absolutely. Whereby, yeah, you have these demands for a life of dignity. You see this alienation. You can you can address. We have access to these interviews. Your your work can be pirated in two minutes on on you on Google, yes. and they can sit down. We can read your book, and we don't even need to get a college degree, and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Right. So uh, what, I, what I'm what I'm hearing you say there's a, there's a crisis of recognition that persists. There's an inability to address the structural dominance and the tyranny of capital in its uh, stage of not merely taking on. I mean, one of the things I write about is the fact that the sexual revolution has really been kind of hijacked by some of this marketization and commodification in the sphere of intimacy. And there's a lot of research on how um, Eva Aluz, the great sociologist, yeah. talks about the end of love mm -hmm. because it becomes so instrumentalized. And you're talking about this psychic takeover. Bernard Stiegler writes about this. Yeah. Christopher Lash writes about this. So what you're really talking about is touching some very deep levels. And we, I, it would be great to sort of continue a part two of this conversation to focus more on the psychic domain. Sure, absolutely. Um, because there's so much work to be done in that, in that area. Um, so I guess... Um, wrapping, wrapping this up, Michael, um, this has been so, so helpful. Um, tell us, tell us a little bit more about how you might, um, introduce these sort of notion to contemporary Marxism of, of Lukács' social ontology. Um, it seems to me that not many people are talking about it. What might be some avenues by which you, you've written a great um, series of essays. I think you were the main editor for historical materialism on the later Lukács. So perhaps it's a question of um, translation, of bringing this stuff from the German, which doesn't doesn't exist and so on. But 
you know, maybe it's also familiarizing ourselves. I had John Bellamy Foster on the program recently where he is talking about his mentor, which is this figure, Mesaros, who's a major socialist philosopher that nobody really knows about. So perhaps it is returning to this particular form of Marxist humanism of Lukács, mm -hmm. but maybe what, what are some other ways that scholars and intellectuals that might be watching this um, might begin to dive into this field of thinking about Marxism in this way that you've opened for us? I, you know, I think actually, um, and Mezaros was one of Lukács' students too, was part of that uh, Budapest school with Agnes Heller and uh, the rest of them. Um, and Mezaros writes a great, a long essay. It actually was published as a separate book on Lukács' conception of the dialectic, which is just wonderful. Um, very nice. So it's a good introduction to the very concept of dialectic. Absolutely. It's short, too. Yeah, it's very nice. And I think um, one way is to actually go back and back and read seriously the early Marx. And I mean... Um, I mean, the focus on capital is great. I think that's been a great renaissance over the past 20 years. David Harvey had a lot to do with this, a lot to do with this, with his you know, lectures on capital um, here in New York that were also published in books and put out on YouTube. Um, but an equivalent emphasis on the early manuscripts of Marx hasn't happened. And that needs to happen because... And the Althusserian fetish that exists, it's dying out a little bit, I think, but that's come back. It, this this has to be this has to be rejected. I mean, the idea that there's this the epistemological break and there's the humanist marks and then that the fluffy marks and then there's this, the science hardcore science marks, that has to be, I think I believe I has to be rejected. And I think that when we go back and look at the early manuscripts, when we go back and look at the theses on Feuerbach, mm. when we go back and look at those uh articles from the the, the Reiner Zeitung and the, when he was a journalist, you see a really, really different picture of, of Marx's ideas about what it means to be a human being, um, what it means, why this is important. And it's a stand-in. It's a stand-in for other theories that might give us a kind of misleading a, a approach to what it, to humanism and what it means to be a human being. And it might lead us down Heideggerian paths or some other right. kind of postmodernist paths or Lacanian paths. Marx has a foundation theory that you can build on in a way that I believe is backed up by a lot of mainstream research in um, anthropology and people like Michael Tomasello. And like a lot of this work kind of reiterates a lot of the basic insights because Marx was getting this from the milieu that came after Hegel. I mean, yeah. one of them, you know. I think of thinkers like another person talking about not translated, uh, but uh, Chiskovsky, you know, one of the great left Hegelians that really talked about praxis as really the central. He adds a third category to Hegel's in and itself and um, for itself. He adds a third category, the from itself, hmm. that the human produces the world. These the, and 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 Feuerbach's almost all of Feuerbach's work. Hey, Marx, we, there aren't these. We've been taught that there are these breaks. Mm. Marx, Marx is new. This stuff is. You, I think Lukash did not see it this way, and mm. I don't think we should. We should see them as a continuity. You should be reading Aristotle. You should be reading the early manuscripts. You should be reading Hegel. You should be reading all this stuff mm. and trying to find how they fit together because we need to respond to the obvious pathologies that we're experiencing. Yes. Yes. So yes. my so one answer to this would be I think go back. Read the Marx that was writing for the public. Read yeah. the Marx that was struggling himself. Right. With, like, what the hell does this mean anything? Is there a way out? Yeah, I'm reading uh, Hal Draper's four volumes on the revolutionary thought of Karl Marx, which is sort of an intellectual biography. And um, as well as, um, I guess, Richard Hunt's uh, the, the Ideas of Marx and Engels, which is another great text. Because I, I do find... Um, intellectual biography a great avenue into uh, you know coming at the development of concepts in the historical context in which they are developed and it's so fascinating to see somebody like Marx who's not an academic philosopher really at all always had a hostile relationship not only to the academy but to 
liberal establishment as such, in part because the liberal establishment was undergoing such a profound crisis in Marx's mm. younger years, mm. they mm. censored him. Yeah. And when he was censored, uh, he really took his early budding communist thinking and he refined it. It didn't. It didn't weaken him as an intellectual. It actually strengthened him as a thinker. That's the dialectic. This is you know he broke from the communist league, which was a kind of secretive Blanquist association. Right. You know, so there's that. There's that. There's also that sort of because I was doing a lot of work on angles, and I'm I am not convinced of angles as dialectics of nature as yeah. the foundation of Marx's thought by any means. But boy, if you study Engels' biography, eesh, one of the most important figures of the of the 19th century, without question, and one of the most educated men, frankly, in a purely autodidactic way, by the way. So, anyways, um, Michael, this has been such a fast-paced and enjoyable just exchange. And I really mean that I would love to have you back on now that I know you have this interest in psychoanalysis. I didn't really know that. Um, what you say as a side point on Fromm, somebody was saying recently that Fromm is one of the reasons in intellectual life why the focus on identity became what it, what it has become. But what I hear you saying is that Fromm is not necessarily a champion of this turn. He's more okay. of, yeah. Could you say something perhaps about that? That really piqued my interest. No, I think that's really wrong. I think from, um, from actually looks looks down on any kind of um, group think in that way. I mean, he's very consistent um, about his theories about you know, what I was talking before about group narcissism. I think he's very, very invested in the idea of the individual, that the individual coming into his or her um, self, you know, uh, self command and kind of integration of their powers. That this that this requires a particular way of relating to the world, that's not pathological. That uh, in fact encourages solidaristic love for others, um, and a kind of democratic way of organizing the internal intrapsychic world, but also the interpersonal world. And I think that um, it's 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 a dynamic way because it's it's talking about how relation. How, pathological relations really get internalized. And this is before object relations, you know, that he's taught his revisions of Freud are happening in the in 1935, 1936, earlier even, um, before Fairbairn and these kind of thinkers. Um, so his ideas are very, very novel. I think they get a bad rap because in many ways they were so popular in the 50s and 60s. You know, The Art of Loving and these kind of books hide actually through their accessibility and extremely sophisticated ideas that Marx even points to. Mm. Um, and I, so I think, I don't think that's true. I think Fromm gives us a way of accessing a kind of selfhood that's very multidimensional and capable of generating relatedness to the world and to nature mm. that is much more democratic, open, humanistic. Mm. Um, and I, I don't I don't think identity would have been one of his things. That's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I've always been drawn to Lacanianism for Marxism, primarily because I find Lacan in his theory of the subject to actually be a very interesting rebuke of predominant forms of bourgeois individualism, yes. precisely insofar as he's not trying to strengthen the ego. His, in other words, his critique of the broad school of ego psychology, which incorporates many forms of psychoanalytic psychology and so on, is really robust and revolutionary. And so there are ways to read these thinkers against the grain. And perhaps you're right that uh, Fromm's popularity ended up with a kind of misapplication of his thought in some ways, where really it's not prescriptive, it's more of, a, of an analytic, critical an analysis of a direction that capitalism is taking. <laughs> but you can see how bourgeois intellectuals or liberal thinkers will 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 uh, latch on to, to that conception of, of, the, of the notion that the self must, that actually that surplus identification is positive and so yeah. on, or that it must be strengthened and so on. 
but of course they're ignoring the substratum behind the causality of this whole process. Which is which is precisely the irrational that Lukash refers to. Right, right. The idea that you can understand the phenomenon without the totality is a fundamental diagnosis that Lukash has of of liberal philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing, yes. Uh and of course there's so much to be said about about Lukács and so there's I feel I feel as if we must have you on again. I'm happy to come back. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, really enlightening. And um, so we'll close here, everybody. Thanks for listening. And uh, Michael, hold on. I'd love to chat with you when we're done. Thanks, everybody.